Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you for coming out in the rain. Thank you for choosing to worship here. Thank you for coming at all. You could have stayed home, drank a cup of coffee, and sat on the back porch and enjoyed the weather. <laughs> Sometimes that just sounds good, doesn't it? Just sit on the back porch, listen to the rain come down. But thank you for being here. We truly appreciate it. I have some announcements. Uh, first, there's nominations meeting tonight at 6 p.m. We're going to meet in the uh, conference room of the Family Life Center. Uh, what that, does that mean for you? Let me say this. God wants you. I need you. This church needs you. and The world desperately needs you to step out in faith and serve. I want to ask you, I'm going to say this. Every one of us who believes in Jesus Christ has received the gift of the Holy Spirit. You've been gifted. You have talents, spiritual gifts, time and the resources to serve um, God in whatever manner he calls you to do that. So know this, you're qualified. You're qualified to serve God. You're qualified through Jesus Christ. And you're empowered to serve God through the Holy Spirit. And so don't wait for someone to recognize your talents, your gifts, your resources. Let us know what you want to do. Let us know you want to serve. And so my phone number is on the very back page of this bulletin. Text me, call me, email me. Tell me what it is you want to do, and we'll try to fit you in somewhere. Remember that God loves you, and he invites you to be in ministry with him. And we need you, everybody in this church, to serve. We can only be the church we're called to be is if everyone agrees to do what God has called them to do, what God has gifted us to do. And so please um, consider serving. Some of you are going to get a, a phone call, and you're going to be asked to serve. I'm not asking you to give an automatic yes. I'm asking you to pray about it. If the answer comes out to be no, you can tell us no, but what I'd like you to do is, no, I don't think that's the position for me, but here's how I think I can serve. Can you find me a role there? So if you can do that, I'd really appreciate it. Also, like to make an announcement that our youth will meet tonight at Denver United Methodist Church at 6 p.m. All of our youth are invited. Um, if you need directions on where to meet there, I can give you those. Just give me a call or text me. Um, I will let Ben know who's coming. Um, they're expecting us. Um, as I said last week, this is until we can grow more youth to give our youth a chance to meet with a larger group of people. And um, Ben's a man of God. The people he's got over there are, are men and women of God. And um, I think this is best for us at this moment. It may change, hopefully change quickly, where we're doing meet them here. But we're inviting all our youth to participate in this. Um, also, please be aware that we record our services. So right now, the, 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 we're filming this. It's live streaming, and it's also uh, being sent to uh, YouTube. And so if you don't want to be on camera... Stay in the back, which most of you are. Uh, so most of you don't want to be on camera. If you have children with you and for some reason you don't want them to be filmed or shown publicly, please make sure they stay in the back. Choir, I'm sorry. You, you're going to be on camera, so smile. But we just need to make sure you know that we're filming and try, we'll try to do that each week in the bulletin through announcements. Um, If you are a leader of a committee or a group or an event, um, you're the best person to share that news with others. And so we'd love for you to make those announcements uh, when it's that time. Or if you can't stand in front of people, I'd love to record you and, and sh we'd show it as a video. Uh, but let's please share what God's doing, how we're being active in the community, and let's get the word out there. Any other announcements I need to make? Then let's prepare to encounter God as the choir leads us in our call to worship.
Let's all stand now together and sing as we're able. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We'll sing verses 1 through 4. It's number 64 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Friends, turn and greet one another in love of Jesus Christ. Friends, at this time, if you'll look in the pew in front of you, you'll find um, uh, pew pads uh, at the end of the pew. If you'll grab one of those, fill it out, and pass it down to the pew. Also, there are um, prayer request cards. If you'll fill one of those out, if you have a prayer request or a praise you'd like me to pray or share. Um, if you, once you're done with that, if you'll just raise it up, one of our ushers will grab that from you. And now, if we'll sit and sing together, what a friend we have in Jesus, we'll sing verses 1 and 3. It's number 526. Unite Methodist Hymnal.
Amen. Thank you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, welcome. Welcome to this place. Welcome in our hearts. Lord, move in us. Transform us. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Lord, we come before you as your children. Come before you as your church. We come before you to worship you. To acknowledge that you are our God. We come before you broken. And to offer you our brokenness. Lord, we come thankful that you love us. That you sent your son to offer us salvation. You sent your spirit to lead us, guide us, and empower us. And you've never left us alone. So, Lord, we come. Lord, when we come and we lift up the names of those who are hurting. Lord, we lift up the names of those who are mourning. Those who are traveling. Those whose bodies are attacking them. Those who are struggling to find a place in this world. Those who are lonely. Those who don't feel loved. Those who don't know your son as Lord and Savior. Those who are angry. Those who are hurt. Those who are lost. And Lord, we lift up those who seem to have it all together. Those who do know you and love you and cherish you. We lift up to your churches across the world. We lift up all, Lord God, because you are the God of all, the God of creation, the God over all. And we know, Lord, that there's nothing, no place in this world that you're not present. No prayer that's unheard and no action that you don't take. We acknowledge, Lord, that you're a mystery. We don't understand your ways. Help us to have faith even though you're a mystery. Lord, we come and we're asking you to empower us to be your church to truly be your church, to love you with all we are, to love our neighbors, to go out into the world and share the good news. Lord, hear our prayer. We know we love you, and you love us more. Hear our prayers as we praise your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friend, let's stand and sing together. Breathe on me, breath of God. Verses 1, 2, and 4. It's number 420 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
This time I'd like to invite our ushers to come down to receive our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. As they do, remind you that what we do is give back to God. The money that we collect is used to spread the word of God, to do the ministries of this church. We ask you to give generously so that we can continue to reach the people in this community. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come and we offer ourselves. We offer our time, our talents, and our treasure. And we ask you to accept them, to anoint them, and ensure they're used, Lord God, to share your love, your grace, and your mercy with this community and the world beyond. We thank you for this privilege of giving back to you. Thank you, Lord God, for allowing us to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Maybe you see it. Our scripture this morning comes from John three. Read verses three one through fifteen. And this morning, I'm actually going to read from two different versions. The first version will be the New Revised Standard Version, and then I'll read from the message. Hear now the word of God. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs you do unless God is with that person. And Jesus answered him, Fairly truly, I tell you, No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. And what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The the wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, 
that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I hope you were listening to that, and I ask you to listen again. Uh, Eugene Peterson um, describes it a little differently. Just I want to read it to make you think. You've heard this verse, these verses, some of you every year, all your life. And so I'd like you to hear them again a little differently. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. And late one night, he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. No one can do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in on it. And Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born from above talk? And Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life, it is not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch, but the person who takes shape within is formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit, and becomes a living spirit. So don't be surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above, by the wind of God, the Spirit of God. And Nicodemus asked, what do you mean by this? How does this happen? And Jesus said, you are a respected teacher of Israel, and you don't know these basics? Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I've seen with my own eyes. There is no second, nothing secondhand here, no hearsay. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you things you can't see? The things of God. No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up and everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Thank you. Last week, we uh, finished up the sermon series on the way of Jesus, and today we start a new one um, inside of the Holy Spirit. And over the next few weeks, we'll be exploring God, the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Spirit, and the role of the Spirit in our lives as Christians. The next few sermons will challenge you, I hope. I pray the sermons will make you think. I pray that they will send you back to Scripture, uh, to study God's Word, to pray on it. I hope these sermons drive you to your knees in prayer. I will tell you that you will disagree with me on some things I say in the next couple of weeks. I know I'm going to say something today that's going to challenge some traditional teaching. Um, I just see a portion of this scripture a little bit differently than some prominent theologians. Um, apparently, I made someone angry in the first service that watched online because they, they remarked with an anger emoji. I'm okay with that. I appreciate that. I hope people are listening so much that I can go toward your emotions and you will be challenged by it. Um, I don't mind us disagreeing. I would love to just talk about it. Um, But I will hopefully challenge you today. Today's scripture, I hope, is a very familiar one. Um, It leads up to probably the most familiar Bible verse in all the world, John 3.16. Um, It kind of gets us there. Um, But I want to wrestle with this conversation Jesus has with this fellow Nicodemus. Uh, I want to wrestle with what he introduces to Nicodemus and and how he goes about doing it and what it means for us. Um, Jesus is having a a conversation uh, with this guy Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Uh, This is important. The Pharisees were a group within the Jewish population um, who were, they followed a strict adherence to the law. And they were calling others to a very strict adherence to the law. Remember, uh, Paul, when he was Saul, was a Pharisee, was a strident adherence to the letter of the law. And so Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was not only a Pharisee, he was a teacher of this way of understanding Scripture, understanding how to live out uh, a, a Jewish life of strict adherence to the law. Um, also, he was a, not only was he a Pharisee, but he was also a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish uh, ruling council, um, and, which was a little unusual. Uh, most of the Sanhedrin were Jewish politicians. They were leaders, most of them very, very wealthy. Uh, they, their, their task was to guide um, the community activities of, of the various um, towns in Israel. They were centered in Jerusalem. They, they ran the temple. Uh, they, they were the political leadership. Uh, and it was unusual to have Pharisees. Not very many Pharisees served on the Sanhedrin. Yet Nicodemus was a Pharisee who also was so well respected by the community that, that he served on the Sanhedrin. And, and that's important to understand that he was respected theologically and uh, politically, socially. Um, the, maybe the most important thing is how Jesus referred to him. Uh, Jesus referred to him as a teacher of Israel. He was someone that people listened to when he taught theology. He was someone that, that wrestled with, with the scriptures and 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 then taught him and tried to explain him in a way people could understand. And, and Jesus respected him in that regard, that he was a teacher of Israel. He, uh, uh, some interpretations say the, the teacher of Israel, some a teacher of Israel, uh, but he was a teacher. And we need to understand who he is to understand part of this conversation he has with Jesus. Now, this leader of men and women, this leader of Judaism, this this leader of the Sanhedrin, this leader of Pharisees, wants to have a conversation with Jesus. And that's not unusual. If you read the New Testament, there were a number of times that Pharisees and the the lawyers, the the Sanhedrin, encountered Jesus, had conversations with him, had arguments with him. But most of them did it by day. 
What's different is that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He arranges to meet Jesus after dark. And in the Gospel of John, that's important because things that happen after dark are usually, I don't know, notable. We need to pay attention to why it's happening and what's going on. And so Nicodemus arranges to meet with Jesus and they start to have a conversation in the, in the secret and at night. And, and I, I want to tell you that I, I said this to the early service. If you get a chance to watch the TV show The Chosen, this particular aspect, this, this, this scene from John 3, I think it's the sixth episode of the first season. If you watch this conversation, it, it's, it kind of puts it in context. It gives you an idea of sort of what a real, the real conversation would have been like. It, it's a version of somebody's understanding of this conversation. But to me, it, it, it really opens eyes. If, you, if, you, if you're like me, I like to watch, see um, things happen in front of me, not just read them. I like to see, visually see it. And it really, um, they do a good job of it. But, but he comes to Jesus this night. He has questions. He has concerns. Um, he, he's struggling, I think. I think if you read this scripture, you see a man who's struggling with what he knows and what's going on in his head and heart. And the two are kind of at odds with each other. You ever been there? You ever felt something in your heart and went against what was in your head? You know, you, you struggle with understanding something. Something's not logical. You know, we have one part of us that everything needs to be logical. You know, and the other part of us is heart. And, and I will admit to you now, as you get to know me, my heart usually wins out over the logic. My wife's logic usually wins out over the heart. We're a perfect match. Um, but uh, just know that if you read this, you can almost see the, the inner struggle in Nicodemus he's having. He's, he's a logical man. He's a man of the law. Things are ordered. I mean, the law is very ordered. Uh, the oral tradition that surrounds the law that was put together by the Pharisees is logical. It, 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 you, if this, do this. It's the old basic computer language. If then, then this. That's how he lived his life. If this happens, I do this. If this doesn't happen, I do this. And then Jesus comes along. And he turns the world upside down. He, and, and Nicodemus is struggling because he sees Jesus and goes, he's a man of God. He can't be because he's so different than everything I know and experience and teach about God and living as a godly person. And I think that's why he comes to Jesus at night, because he wants to have a private conversation that's not in front of people, because his heart is troubled. I believe the Holy Spirit is at work in Nicodemus and drives him to encounter Jesus in this way. I believe that the conversation Jesus has with Nicodemus is Jesus answering the unasked questions in Nicodemus' heart. I mean, think about who, Jesus, who Nicodemus is. He's a Pharisee. He's a, a politician. He's wealthy. He comes to Jesus and goes, you're a man of God. It's obvious you're a man of God. But what goes unsaid is, but I'm a man of the law. I see you as a man of God, but you don't fit. You're not a puzzle piece that fits with everything we've been teaching, everything we've been doing, everything we've been telling the people. I imagine Nicodemus thinking, I want to believe I want to believe, but I can't. It goes against all logic. And yet in his heart, he's going, but you're from God. You're from God. You're from God. And Jesus says to him, to answer the unasked question, unless, <laughs> unless a person is born from above, it is not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, in your, in your humanness, you can't understand this. In your humanness, logically, none of this is going to make sense to you unless you're born above, unless you surrender your humanness to something greater. And you can't, and it's not going to happen now. We'll see that later. It's not going to happen now. But Jesus is, is telling, unless you surrender to the Holy Spirit, you're not going to understand Unless you allow the Holy Spirit to renew your heart, you will never accept my teachings, never accept the reality of God's kingdom, never accept Jesus as the Son of God and Redeemer of the world, he says. Think about the words Jesus uses. Unless a person submits, 
I love the way Eugene Peterson writes it. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. One of the great mysteries of science um, is scientists have forever tried to explain how our creation came to be, how the world came to be, how the universe came to be, how it's coming to be, because creation is still happening. The universe is still expanding. New galaxies are forming. And they've tried to explain it. The, the prominent version right now is the Big Bang Theory. I happen to believe in a version of the Big Bang. I believe God spoke and the world came into existence and is coming into existence. I believe that science is struggling with understanding just how that happened, but I think the longer they look, the more it's going to point back to God and God being the source of the Big Bang. But one of the images of of creation that's in Scripture is of the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters of creation. Remember that from Genesis? Holy Spirit hovering over the waters of creation. The Holy Spirit sparking life, giving life to creation. God speaks all into creation. The Spirit hovers over it and all life comes forth. And I believe the creation that, that Jesus is talking about when he's talking about a baptism of water and spirit. And here's where I'm going to push against some of your, your theology that you've learned because there are some very prominent theologians I respect and have studied my whole life that differ than what I'm going to say, but I, I just see it a little differently. I believe when Jesus is speaking of being born of water and spirit, he's speaking of the earthly bodily being born of water and a spiritual rebirth. I know that many of us have been taught that he's talking of baptism and the Holy Spirit. I I believe that that he's actually speaking about creation and this image of creation of the Holy Spirit hovering over um, the the, the creation waters. And I believe he's referring to that when when he gives this image of a baby being born. If you know about birth, babies are birthed forth from water. From the creation waters that are in the womb, God places the life of a child in a mother's womb. The spark of life is given by the Holy Spirit, and we come forth out of water. We all know the term, her water has broken. I believe that's creation water. I believe that's the image. Because this, if you read the, the, the New Rosiah Standard, Jesus is talking about birth and rebirth. Nicodemus is seeing it as a physical birth. Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth. And so I believe that in his description, he's talking about a physical birth and then a spiritual rebirth, being born from above. And he wants to use this creation, this understanding that the Holy Spirit was present at creation and gave life over the waters of creation, gave life and life sprang forth. And Jesus is saying the same thing. You're born, you're human. But you also need to be born again from above, from the Holy Spirit. Jesus says when you look at a baby, in in Eugene Peterson's interpretation, when you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within is formed by something you can't see and touch, the Spirit, and becomes a living Spirit. The Bible teaches that the Spirit has been with us forever. From the very beginning, the Spirit has been present. The Spirit has hovered over the creation waters. The Spirit has come through time, keeping this world from utter chaos. The Spirit has been ministering to every human being that's ever been. Just most of the time, we don't recognize the Spirit or acknowledge the Spirit. But if we just let the Spirit move in us, hear the Spirit, pay attention to the Spirit, then then when the gospel is spoken, will actually pay attention to it. And that's this image that we have of Nicodemus who's struggling. A man of God who sees God one way is struggling because the Spirit is working on his heart. And Jesus is acknowledging that this is the Spirit working on his heart. We must accept in our hearts the truth of this, the the truth that, that God is real, the truth that God loves us, the truth that of Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension, 
and the truth of the Holy Spirit's creative and transformative power. Jesus is introducing a subject that Paul is going to expound on later, but he's trying to prepare Nicodemus for this. He's trying to prepare a teacher of the law on this so that later he can teach it, he can understand it when he sees it happening for him. He's trying to let Nicodemus understand what's going on within. The Spirit is moving, but the Spirit has not yet come to earth in power, but he will. You see, it's only through faith that we can be born anew. Jesus says it's only through faith that we can be born anew in the Spirit and see the reality of the kingdom of God. See, much about God is a mystery, and that irks us. See, we're mostly logical beings, aren't we? We, we like to know how things work. We, we want to know why things happen the way they happen. We want to understand everything. We think we should understand everything. And, and God is so immense, so incredible, that we can't even, be, even begin to understand God, but it irks us that because we truly want to understand God. We want to wrap our heads around the vastness of God because we want to be in control, and we can't control God. Jesus asked, he asked Nicodemus, you know the wind, right? You feel the wind, but where's the wind from? Nicodemus acknowledges he doesn't know. He doesn't grasp all things. And that's the beginning of it. We have to admit that we don't know all things, that God's a mystery, but still have faith in God. The vastness of God's purposes can be a barrier to our faith because we don't understand it. But that's where faith comes into it. Our humanness gets in the way of that. So we have to have faith. So we must be born of the Spirit to find peace in the mystery of God. There's no logical explanation for God. There's not. So we have to quit trying to find logical explanations for God. We have to trust that what we see with our eyes, this creation we have, we have to trust with our hearts the love that God fills us with is real and have faith. I mean, think about this. Jesus refers to Moses lifting up a bronze servant so the people of Israel would be saved. They're being attacked by snakes. They, 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 they're in a situation, they're being punished, and so they're being attacked by serpents and dying from it. And the way they cannot die from this is Jesus lifts up a bronze servant on a stick, and if they look upon that stick and believe that it'll save them, they'll save them. They won't die. Now, is that logical? If I came in here, everybody in here is sick, and I say, look upon these glasses, and you'll be saved. How many of you would find that logical? Nobody. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit's a mystery. I don't understand why God had Moses do that, but what he wanted from Israelites was faith, that God was in control, that God was in charge. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus in this conversation I understand you're a follower of the law but what you need more than being a strict adherent of the law is faith to allow the Holy Spirit come into your life to empower you to move you to open your eyes to see the kingdom after Jesus lives his life and goes to his cross and dies our death. We have a choice we have to make. Jesus is explaining this to Nicodemus. You have to make a choice. You have to choose in your own power to live by the law, or you have to have faith in my life, my death, my resurrection, my ascension, and that I'm saying I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. You have to have faith that what I do matters and changes things. And you have to have faith that the Spirit is going to help you see that and live that out. It takes faith. It's not logical. What we teach, what we preach, what we proclaim, what we're going to share with the world is not logical. It takes an act of faith to open our eyes, to begin to see God at work, to see the Spirit in action, to understand that a few people in Terrell, North Carolina, in Cheryl's Ford, in Denver, 
Mooresville, wherever you're from, can make a huge impact in this great world. But through faith, the Holy Spirit transforms us, renews our life, then sends us out to share that message of love, grace, and mercy, to share that spark of life with the world. We must choose to respond to Jesus in faith. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across to Nicodemus. You see it, but you don't understand it. You need to see it and have faith. And then you need to have faith in what you can't see and understand. One of my prayers daily, man, and it's hard to admit this, but I, I, I pray, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. It's from Mark 9. It's not, I'm not the only one who's ever prayed that. It's in Scripture. It's a prayer. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Because I don't understand it. I don't understand the mystery of the Holy Spirit. But I was given a, 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 an image to, to try to help me understand it. Um, in, in technology, there's a fairly new uh, technology out there. It's a development called hypersonic sound. And hypersonic sound is they can take um, a sound laser. They, they, I don't know how they do it. I'm not a scientist. But they can project sound in a small beam and shoot it to a, about 150 yards out and direct it toward a person. And, and that sound is only heard if you're within that beam. So if I'm directing it toward the back corner to Johnny back there in the back corner, and, and I isolate it on Johnny, Johnny will hear what I'm saying or the music that's being played, but Janine won't hear it. Only Johnny will hear it. Only Johnny will know what's going on. For the Christian church, that's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we've opened our hearts in faith to Jesus Christ. And we've allowed the Holy Spirit to enter our hearts. And so we have a power within us that no one else can hear or understand. The Holy Spirit. Because we've opened our hearts to Christ, we recognize that the Holy Spirit has always been active, always been around, always been moving and working in creation, always been the spark of life. We're, we can be open to that because of the Holy Spirit within us. I said this as we were walking, uh, as I was leaving church the last service to someone who asked a question. We shouldn't judge the people of the Old Testament very harshly. Because we have something they never had. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit not only present in the world, but present within our lives. All the struggles the people of the Old Testament had, all the struggles that the disciples had, it's because they did not have the Holy Spirit within them. They didn't even have the ability to try to listen to the Holy Spirit or recognize the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was in the world, but not within them. We have been granted the great privilege of God's presence within us to speak to us, lead us, and guide us, to open our eyes so we can see the kingdom of God at work. We can see the Holy Spirit moving already in ministry around us if we'll but pay attention, if we'll but accept that God is who he says he is, God is real, that Jesus Christ came and died for us, and that God did send the Holy Spirit to not only hover over creation, but to dwell within us, to lead us and guide us, to have faith in that, and then to desire to pay attention to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is around us and within every believer. The Spirit still hovers over creation, but we must place ourselves in a situation to feel, to hear, to respond to the Spirit. We must surrender in prayer. We must surrender ourselves in worship. We must surrender ourselves to hearing God's word being spoken to reading scripture. We must surrender ourselves to God's love, acknowledging God's love for us, God's grace, God's mercy. We must accept Jesus Christ's sacrifice, and we must place ourselves in the path of the Holy Spirit. If we do that, we will live out our calling in Christ. Imagine this. Nicodemus had this conversation with Jesus and did not yet have the Holy Spirit, but this conversation, being in Jesus' presence and just grasping a little bit of this story, a little bit of what Jesus was trying to teach him, changed him forever. 
Because the next time we hear about Nicodemus, he's defending Jesus in front of the Pharisees, in front of the Sanhedrin. They want to arrest him for no reason whatsoever other than they're scared of him. And Nicodemus argues against that. And then the next time we see him is on the day of Jesus' death. The next time the Bible describes Nicodemus, he's there taking Jesus off of the cross. He's there with the burial salves, with the ointments used to prepare his body for burial. He's there carrying Jesus into the tomb. I have no doubt that Nicodemus, in all his doubt and confusion, was responding to the Holy Spirit. What if we but relinquish control and respond to God, the Holy Spirit, moving in our lives? Not only moving around us, but think, we have something Nicodemus didn't even have. We have the Holy Spirit within our hearts as believers in Jesus Christ. Let us open our hearts, open our minds to be led and empowered by the Spirit. Imagine the things we can accomplish as a church if we do that. Imagine the lives that God can use us to change if we do that. Let's pray. Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are yours. Lord, we believe. We have faith. Help our unbelief. Help our unfaithfulness. Lord, help us to open ourselves to you, to allow our faith in Jesus' acts on the cross, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, allow that faith to allow us to, to bow down and open up to receive the incredible gift of the Holy Spirit, to not quench it, to not push it away, but to accept your very presence in our lives 24-7, to allow you to transform us, to give us new life over and over and over again, moving us back toward an image of you to be like your son, filled with the Holy Spirit to impact the world. Lord, we're yours. Lord, help us to be yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, let us stand and we're going to sing together. I am thine, O Lord. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. It's number 419 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
Friends, as we got into the world, received this blessing. May the Lord bless and protect you. May the Lord's face radiate with joy because of you. May the Holy Spirit be gracious to you, show you divine favor, and give you the peace of Christ. Go forth in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.